Welcome everyone, Questini here with a discussion about Helmand Gorst in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires, who is one of the most powerful Legendary Lords in the game. In fact, when Immortal Empires came out, a lot of people were of the perspective that this guy was fly out the most broken guy in the game. And he was because he was quite broken, in the sense that he virtually had unlimited healing, for his zombies, so his zombies could not die. Now, Creative Assembly has fixed that, but Helmand Gore still, still remains one of the most powerful in the entire game. And actually, he has a fairly interesting campaign in more ways than one. You might think, oh, it's all about the zombies, but no, it's not just about the zombies. Though I would argue that Helmand Gorst may have the most powerful armies of any Vampire Council or Jirin Lord. Like others may have better hero capabilities, better lord effects, but in terms of the capabilities of armies, Gorse does fly out to have the best armies, and a lot of potential in his campaign. He starts over here next to the Haunted Forest at war with some Skaven, minor Skaven faction that he'll easily obliterate. And it's interesting to note that the Vampire Counts do fairly well, on higher difficulties because they actually scale with higher difficulties indirectly but the scaling happens because on higher difficulties you'll face more armies and what happens with vampire counts is when you kill enemy troops in battle or where there's a major bell there's major opportunities of recruitment and this is not even what you're seeing over here is not even the most n ridiculous uh, capabilities of recruitment. In fact, this is relatively tame. Like, you haven't seen the ability of recruiting Blood Knights over here, or Black Knights or Barding, Lance and Barding, which I have recruited. So, one of the things to mention about the Vampire Counts is that they do have that kind of level of scalability uh, and very easy recruitment of units of all kind of unit types. And they have an economy to support that. Now, one of the significant benefits, of course, doesn't start with his faction effects, it starts with his climate. So he has magical forests, wasteland, mountains, temperate, and desert. What that means in practice is that while he doesn't have every climate in the game, he's missing frozen, he's missing temperate islands, savanna, and jungle, as well as cast wasteland and ocean, Though having ocean and cast wasteland as being the only two uninhabitable climates in a campaign is a significant uh, advantage, what this really means in practice is when you're looking at the campaign map, you gotta understand that he's got territory all the way from the east to Ulf 1 that he can take over without any kind of penalties. Like, this is a guy who can take over like two thirds of the world without incurring any climate penalty. And that is actually a very powerful advantage. Even compared to the other legendary lords of the vampire counts, like he is better than Vlad. Maybe not necessarily better than Kemmler, to be sure, but the climate advantage is significant. And well, being able to take magical forests is not something you should sneeze at. Especially because these kind of magical forests do work fairly well for the vampire counts, uh, because vampire counts want to maintain as many provincial capitals as possible to increase their hero capacity. So that's the first thing to mention about Gorst, is he does have that climate situation. And then he has the faction effect. So he gets 10% casualty replenishment, which is not really a big deal for vampire counts because they get plenty of opportunities for casualty replenishment. But hey, you know, 10% is 10%. He gets poison attacks for zombies. He gets raised dead pull capacity plus four for zombie units. He gets lesser raised dead for corpse cart and more dissension units. So that's summoning zombies. And it just ends up being a fairly good amount of power. But that's not all we're talking about with regards to his faction effects. He gets other benefits for zombies, melee attack, ward save, faction-wide, battle healing cap, faction-wide, and crucially with that battle healing cap, ravenous dead. See, it's the ravenous dead ability that makes Gorst so fucking crazy. Zombies have a lot of HP, but they take a lot of damage as well. Well, give them ward save, give them weapon strength 50%, give them a lot of benefits, and then couple that with research benefits as well because we gotta talk about those melee defense melee attack 
physical resistance, 20% physical resistance for zombies. I mean, even without this, of course, the zombies are pretty powerful. With this and Vanguard deployment, they are fucking ridiculous. And the insane part about his zombies is that he hard counters the f every faction that's near him, with the exception of uh, Drazov to an ex uh, and to an extent Emmerich. Though if you're thinking Emmerich is gonna stop course, uh, no. But crucially, he hard counters the factions that actually would fight him, most likely, like Nurgle. So it's kind of trolly from Creative Assembly to put Kugaf right next to Gorst when Gorst is so powerful against him. And maybe, and Greasus as well. Like, if you play a campaign as Greasus, fighting Gorst is an absolute nightmare in a campaign. Like, in this particular case, I have vassalized Greasus in this campaign, though I, I'm not sure how good of a vassal he is. Though vassalizing him may deter, if you will, Grimgor from attacking. Like, I see factions just being unwilling to attack if you have a vassal. So it's going to take a lot for Grimgor to attack. And even when he does attack, well, let's just say Greasus is going to be ready for him. Still, uh, the problem is for Greasus is that he doesn't have the damage dealing capability with a lot of uni these units to overcome Gorse uh, zombies early on in a campaign. If you're playing either Greasus or Kugaf, this is a major freaking issue. And even Xiao Ming who, in this case, uh, <laughs> rarely enough, like Miao Ying has, I guess she, fa uh, she confederated this faction. But even Xiao Ming uh, and Cafe in general, they rely on a lot of, m like, Jade Warriors, Peasants, and yes, they can get Jade Warrior Crossbowmen and all that, but they can be overwhelmed fairly easily, in point of fact, by the swarm of zombies. Though, thankfully for Xiao Ming, if you're playing a campaign as him, Gorse doesn't particularly hate you. It's only really Kugaf that's the big issue. But point is, Gorse is stronger with his zombies, just his zombies alone, than all of his neighbors. And because he can get so many zombies, well, to give you an idea, there's 19 zombies in my capital ready to be recruited instantly. 13 in another province. 13 again in the aisles, eight, um, 18 units in th total, 8. And that's beyond the fact that you can recruit zombies normally from any settlement. And speaking about recruiting zombies, you start with this, with this structure that gives you plus 4 recruit rank, 4 zombie units, and then 6 recruit, uh, recruit rank for zombie units once you get to tier 3. This is a, an absurd level of power. Furthermore, because we're not done here, you also have Nagashazar, which starts as a tier 5 settlement, though you'll take it as a tier 4 one, and you also have Zarn and Grund relatively close enough. This is an advantage in a lot of campaigns, to be certain, in this area, uh, but you're, like, it's much easier for you to do it. Uh, the only one who can do it as easily as you is Grimgor himself, and let me just say that if I'm comparing a Legendary Lord to Grimgor, you know he's good. But unlike Grimgor, you actually have a ridiculous level of landmarks here. You start with one landmark. You have another landmark over here that increases the battle healing cap for necromancers and master necromancers uh, over here. Uh, you have another one that produces the gemstones and gives you a huge amount of growth, even if the climate here in these isles is not great. You even have Nagashizar, which gives you physical resistance for all armies and cooldown to all spells and reduces raid's dead cost. That's, uh, that's pretty crazy. You have the Graves of Dragons, which gives you Lord Recruit rank. Uh, you have the Tower of the Bloody Tooth, which gives you upkeep benefits for Crypt Golds and Crypt Towers, weapon strength for those units, and income. Point is, there's a lot of landmarks in this area like in the area you're starting in. And then as you expand, you'll obviously encounter more and more landmarks. So in this case, I think like Queek is gonna get access to it. And of course you have all of the advantages that the vampire counts do have in their campaigns, including, for instance, diplomatic vassalizations. Over here I vassalized Queek and Greases. Greases is whatever. Queek is an incredibly powerful legendary lord. The key is to attack him, take some territory, sell him, get a piece of ground, sell it back, and yeah, just get a significant uh, level of power through diplomacy there. So vampire counts in general do very well 
from a diplomatic perspective. Now, the downside of this campaign, you may have the power of the armies. The reason you have the power of the armies is you can recruit every other unit in the entire roster and, of course, comes with the only paid DLC for the Vampire Count. So, if you want the entire roster, you're going to have this legendary Lord. So, you have every unit, every hero, everything that is available to every other legendary Lord that the Vampire Counts is available to you. So, you've got Graveguard, you've got Black Knights, you've got... Uh, You've got the ability of the bloodlines to get access to that, and in fact, I'd recommend you go for something like the Bl uh, Dragon Dark Arts, which gives you 100 experience per turn for uh, uh, all your armies. That is pretty damn powerful. Uh, pretty damn powerful when we're looking at it. Though I personally prefer starting with Lamian for the character experience gain. And then working for Blood Dragon and then, yeah, getting Varkarstein. I, I don't generally bother with the Necarks uh, because you do need to... Like, it can be useful later on, sure, with the Strigoi as well. But you do need to get to a fairly high level over here. Whereas, yeah, Lamian is going to give you a benefit and Blood Dragon is going to give you a huge benefit once you get to Tier 2 with them. A lot alone with Tier 3. Also, Blood Dragons are incredibly powerful in battle. And uh, they also give you the Grave Sentinels, which reduces the upkeep of grave guard units you could argue for doom rider personally i'm not fond of that because you're probably going to have more grave guard than you're going to have black knights in in an army and besides uh you're always going to get uh, the blood knight upkeep benefit so that's ultimately what you might be going for shame that black knights can't be upgraded into blood dragons but hey that's just different discussion still you don't have to rely on zombies but the crucial thing is, you can have a couple of powerful units in an army that win the battles for you, and then you can have your super zombies in armies that they will win the battle themselves against many armies on their own, but in difficult battles, like against a proper stack of forces, uh, they would just hold them down for a very, very long time. And because of the poison attacks, the, uh, the ravenous attacks, the physical resistance, the ward save, all of that, and their massive amount of HP, they will last long in battles. Like Vampire Counts, when we're looking at their armies, Vampire Counts are not about having the entire army be incredibly powerful. That's really expensive. Like, you can get really powerful armies with every unit being incredibly strong, but the best way to play Vampire Counts is having a couple of units that are just there to hold the line while your heroes, your lords, and your powerful units, cavalry, monsters, all that win the battle for you. Well, Gorst has a lot of chaff because of the cheap zombies. Incredibly cheap zombies. Like, you look at the cost of zombies in this guy, like 18 upkeep, 20 upkeep. Very, very cheap to recruit, very plentiful. Like, we're basically recruiting, like, you can get to a point where you're recruiting zombies for free in your campaign. That is the level of power that you have here. And a zombie army might be like a couple of hundred upkeep, where the most expensive thing of a full zombie stack is the Lord. Then you can just have a couple of these crap stacks running around. Like, put them together, they'll even auto-resolve a lot of battles in a campaign, or have them support your main armies. And you're basically paying for the cost of a couple of units like you would otherwise, for instance. Or the cost of a Lord might be the entire cost of the army that you're really paying there. And that really saves you a lot of money for a faction that already has a decent level of income. Actually, a pretty good level of income. They do lack a tier 2 building, so that does hurt them a bit. But the Vampire Count's economy is not struggling in Warhammer 3. One of the things that's kind of an issue with the Vampire Counts is like you only have two buildings that are worth getting and one of them is a growth building. So it's like, yeah, you kind of run out of stuff to build in minor settlements because you don't need recruitment structures in minor settlements. If there is any issue in a Gorse campaign, it's the fact that you don't have any kind of hero capacity benefit like Vlad, Isabella, or Kemmler do, for instance, because they do have significant hero capacity benefits. Also, you start the furthest away from any of the Vampire Counts, Legendary Lords. You can use the Recruit Defeat a Legendary Lords mod, for instance, to get the Red Duke if you really want to, because he typically will be wiped out by Bretonia. So he's just basically a Blood Dragon who has the ability of getting both the Grave Sentinels and Doom Rider skill chains. That's the only real difference between him. He doesn't have any items or anything like that, uh, though he does have a shield, a bronze shield, as opposed to dual wielding as 
uh, leg regular blood dragons uh, do uh, over there. So, it doesn't matter. <laughs> there is an absurd level of power in this campaign. Uh, the victory conditions are just like take Nagashi's Aru, which you'd want to do anyway, and wipe out Nurgle, which you'd want to do anyway. It's there. The downside, the two downsides, distance from other Legion Lords, and the fact that for a long campaign you do need to go back in the Empire, but there's no real reason to worry too much about that in in a lot of ways because you don't necessarily care about the long campaign victory condition unless you want some achievement or something like that. You have a lot of flexibility in this campaign. You can play in the entire campaign in Cafe, you can play it in the Mountains of Morn, you can play it in Darklands, you can go all the way to Empire. I would say this campaign is better for a long campaign like Vlad, Isabella, even Manfred and Kemmler. They're better for short campaigns, but if you're looking to play a long campaign as a vampire counts, then Gorst is really good for it. He's kind of crap in a short campaign because you will just be building a lot of zombies and using them in a lot of manual battles. Though, interestingly enough, one benefit that should be recognized in this campaign is the fact that zombies do very poorly in auto resolve. And what that will actually lead to is a lot of factions underestimating you because. They might do poorly in auto resolve, but not in manual battles. So what will happen a lot in a campaign when you're playing the vampire counts, as Gore specifically with a lot of zombies, is you'll have a lot of armies, even smaller ones, that would never stand a chance against you, just attacking you, moving away from defensive positions, which means you get a lot of experience, you get benefits. Like if you're fighting a series of smaller battles, that's actually more beneficial in your campaign as opposed to one big brawl at their capital, for instance. And that's one of the benefits, like, that's one of the hidden benefits, if you will, in a Gorst campaign. Like, people will rush out to meet you thinking that they'll just put the zombies in the ground. Well, they won't. There's few armies that can easily deal with Gorst, and truth be told, I've played a lot of campaigns in this area. The only one who really can obliterate Gorst is Drazov, if you commit a lot of resources with that, but Drazov has his own issues, like Tretch, for instance, might be an issue. Like, actually, in this particular campaign, it was me, Greasus, Tretch, and, and, and Tretch just ganking up on poor Drazov, obliterating him, and, well, um, then we obliterated Tretch, me, and Greasus, of course, because who wouldn't want to obliterate uh, Tretch? That's exactly what ended up happening in, this, in that particular situation. And Rhesus took care of Cape Peaks because reasons. Anyway, there's a significant level of power in this campaign. It can be fairly dull if um, if you are engaging in a lot of those manual battles, but there is a significant level of power here. And honestly, like you don't have to just use zombies. You can use Grave Guard. You can use all of these units. You can eventually get a lot of heroes. You just won't have that early game power, but it's really strong in, in the mid-late game. That's all I had to say. Questine here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and I'll see you next time.